Tonight, the deadly heat wave, 100 million Americans on alert as temperatures soar. Hot and dry conditions fueling this raging wildfire in Arizona. Thousands of acres scorched and several neighborhoods under evacuation orders. The arrest tonight after authorities say the blaze was started by burning toilet paper. Plus, all entrances to Yellowstone National Park closed due to flooding and rock slides. The system now moving east, packing heavy rain, strong winds, and possible tornadoes. Recession fears, a stock sell-off intensifying amid runaway inflation and record gas prices. The S&P tumbling more than 4%, closing in bear territory. The Federal Reserve now considering an interest rate hike higher than expected. What it means for your money. Also tonight, Trump's inner circle in the hot seat. Several former aides testifying former President Trump ignored evidence he lost the election. His former Attorney General William Barr not mincing words, saying Trump was, quote, detached from reality when he pushed claims of voter fraud. Garrett Haight with the latest from Capitol Hill. Plus, the alarming new report showing COVID restrictions prevented inspections at the largest baby formula manufacturers in the country, one which was later closed due to a bacterial contamination linked to infant illness. The plant back open, but parents are still struggling to get cans of formula with one in five states nearly completely out of its supply. Skyrocketing rents, the average monthly price topping $2,000 for the first time ever. So what's driving the historic rise in rent? And Amber Heard breaks her silence, speaking for the first time since a jury found she defamed ex-husband Johnny Depp. What she said about the high-profile trial and the outside influence she thinks swayed the verdict. Top Story starts right now. And good evening. We start the week under a record-setting heat wave. 100 million Americans under some type of heat alert. The soaring temperatures even turning deadly in Colorado and helping fuel multiple wildfires across the country. There's new video tonight showing a raging wildfire near northern Arizona. It's already burned thousands of acres, and more residents are preparing to evacuate as crews struggle to fight it. At least one person has been arrested for sparking that fire. Severe storms also bringing heavy flooding and rock slides to Yellowstone National Park. Officials now working to evacuate some visitors amid a busy summer season. As severe weather continues, several states, including Illinois, warning about potential power outages. So we begin with Kathy Park, who leads us off from Chicago. Right, here we go again. Tonight, the historic heat wave fueling dangerous fires across the southwest. Pipeline fire in Arizona exploding, tripling in size in just one day, burning at least 5,000 acres. Hundreds have been evacuated and thousands more are on high alert, ready to leave. If the wind changes direction, it changes everything. Our fate is in the wind's hand. As crews try to contain the flames, today officials say they arrested a 57-year-old man in connection with the wildfire and charged him with natural resource violations. Yeah, super frustrating. Like, that's all I can say is I'm just really angry at the person. I'm glad he's caught. Our affiliate KPNX said the suspect is homeless and was camping in the area. They say he reportedly told deputies he burned his toilet paper. In New Mexico, officials are battling the biggest fire in the state's history, sparked when the U.S. Forest Service set prescribed burns that were intended to clear out underbrush. We need to be sure this doesn't happen again. Since early April, the fires has spread out of control, destroying hundreds of homes across 500 square miles. In California, the sheep fire is still burning near the Angeles National Forest. Cal Fire says it has scorched nearly 1,000 acres so far. It was reported on Saturday night and on Sunday grew from 35 acres to roughly 1,000. The cause is still under investigation and only 5% contained. Meanwhile, more extreme weather in Texas. The triple digit heat turning dangerous with more medical emergencies. We think that the early start to the hot weather this year combined with the a lot more people doing things than they were perhaps last year is leading to this incredible volume. Since May 1st, we have responded to 166 heat-related calls. 25 of those have been serious, four critical. And the bad weather doesn't end there. All entrances to Yellowstone National Park are closed due to heavy flooding and rock slides. Entire sections of roads washed out. The park will be closed at least through Wednesday. All right, Kathy Park joins us now live from Chicago, where the heat is starting to build. The Midwest is now bracing for a record-breaking heat wave. 
Tom, that's right. The day is winding down here in Chicago, but it is still a muggy 84 degrees. But come Tuesday and Wednesday, it will be near 100 degrees. When you factor in humidity, it will feel closer to 110 degrees. And because of the potential dangers attached with this heat wave, some schools in the Midwest are going virtual or dismissing their students early tomorrow. Tom? All right, Kathy Park leading us off tonight. Kathy, we thank you for that. For more on those severe storms and how long this dangerous heat will last, I want to bring in NBC News meteorologist Dylan Dreyer. So, Dylan, you're also tracking these storms tonight. There's a lot going on, and we are going to see a lot of severe weather tonight as well. You can see just north of Chicago, we had those stronger storms. Also, uh, just north of Cincinnati, we have severe thunderstorm watches and warnings have been issued. We also have strong wording from the uh, uh, Storm Prediction Center where we could see wind gusts over 75 miles per hour in the form of a derecho, which is basically a long track storm. It stays on the ground for a long period of time and produces straight line wind gusts, which could cause significant damage. We're also looking at the possibility of hail one and a half inches or more in diameter and tornadoes could be mixed in with this complex as well. As for the heat, 100 million people are under some sort of heat advisory, heat watch or heat warning. You can see, especially right back through the Midwest, where temperatures are going to most likely break records over the next several Several days. So take a look at some of the highs we're going to see tomorrow. Chicago 97 with a heat index of 105. St. Louis, it'll feel like 108. Same in Nashville. Cincinnati will feel like 111 degrees. This is excruciating heat in an area where you don't get it all that often. So you want to stay hydrated. You want to stay in the air conditioning and you want to stay cool as best as possible. On Wednesday, we're still looking for triple digit heat in St. Louis, but it'll feel like 106. Lexington feels like 105. Pittsburgh even feels like it's 102. We will get some relief, especially back through uh, Tennessee into uh, parts of the Midwest where we go from triple digit heat down to, say, 92 by the time we get to Friday or Saturday. And then the heat will try to build eastward, but it never quite makes it into the northeast. We'll get into the 90s, but I don't think we'll break as many records. But this heat is dangerous and it is going to stick around all week long, Tom. All right, Dylan, we thank you for that. Our other big story tonight, the economy. Stocks are tanking today. The Dow dropping almost 900 points, falling by three. And the Wall Street Journal out with a big story tonight right there as the markets brace for the possibility of a larger than expected Fed rate increase. Instead of half a point, they may raise it almost a full percentage point. And gas prices, of course, reaching an all time high. NBC's Tom Costello has a story. Gloom and red arrows on Wall Street today as sky high inflation and a potential recession weigh heavily on investors. After being down a thousand points, the Dow closed down 876 today, now down 16% for the year. The tech and biotech heavy Nasdaq down 30% year to date. And the broader S&P index, common in Americans' portfolios, sliding into bear market territory, down 21% year to date. All of it real money for Americans, saving for their retirement, college savings, or a new home. The two things you can control, even in a market like this, is how much you save and how much you spend. And it's really important to stay on track. To tame 40-year high inflation, the Federal Reserve is expected to raise interest rates again on Wednesday, perhaps by another three quarters of a point. The Fed has to worry about whether or not it can stick to those game plans and whether or not Wall Street will believe them down the line. That's why Fed credibility, so to speak, is so key right now. It comes as inflation is forcing Americans to adjust their spending. From Los Angeles. Road trips, there's no way. It's just ridiculous. It's cheaper to fly. To Boston. It feels like you can't catch a break almost. Where Sophia Lee is parking the car, riding her bike to work, and even babysitting to offset skyrocketing gas and food prices. It's just difficult to save up for the things that I do need in the long term. An economy, a country increasingly on edge. All right, Tom joins us now. Tom, I want to go back to that point we mentioned in the intro and in your report. There are some who now believe the Fed may hike rates higher than initially believed this week. Yeah, so we have been expecting a 50 basis point rate hike. That's half a percentage point this week. That's what the Fed has been telegraphing. But because that inflation report was so bad last week, 8.6 percent, no sign of it slowing, the pressure has been building on the Fed to raise rates by three quarters of a point. Now, the Wall Street Journal and CNBC reporting that's definitely on the table. So we may get a three quarters of a percentage point rate hike on Wednesday. That would be a very big rate hike and underscores how serious this inflation problem is. 
All right, Tom Costello for us tonight. Tom, we thank you for that. All eyes are on the Fed. And as Tom mentioned, signs pointing to a larger than expected rate hike, which along with other damaging economic data spooked the markets. All three major indices are down with the S&P 500 closing in bear market territory for the first time since March 2020. NBC News senior business correspondent Stephanie Rule joins us now. I wanted to have Steph on so we could dig a little deeper into this. Steph, late today, the Washington Post editorial board published this piece. I want to read you just a graph from it. Uh, uh, they say the stock market has slumped into bear market territory. The bond market is flashing recession warning signs. The real estate market is drying up. Investors predict the Fed has to hike interest rates 175 basis points by the end of September. Now, the Fed gains little by delaying the pain that everyone sees coming at this point. So, Steph, do you agree with that? Do you think the Fed has to go big now? Listen, it's a very complicated situation. When you look at the administration and say, what is the White House doing? We have to remember, the White House has little tools to address this. It is all about the Fed. The Fed needs to find a way to slow down inflation. How do they do that? They raise rates. But here's the tricky thing, Tom. This is like threading a needle. If they raise rates too much, too quickly, they will tip us into recession. Why? Because high interest rates mean it slows down the economy. It's more expensive to borrow. It's harder for businesses to do business. So that could hurt the economy. But on the other hand, if they don't raise rates in a significant way and quickly, you're going to keep seeing prices go higher, and that's unbearable. So kind of both sides are difficult. You've got a Fed meeting coming across the next two days, and if Jay Powell doesn't figure out how to thread this needle, it's going to be painful on both ends. So, Steph, you know, a lot of people look at their 401ks during this time. If you're a retiree, I really feel for you because I know those numbers are not where you want them to be. A lot of market watchers are convinced this is only the beginning and that the bottom is still far away. But some, like certain executives at J.P. Morgan, think the market can recover and finish the year flat. Where's your thinking on this? What is the next six months, do you think, going to look like for the stock market? The overall market can recover because, remember, we are in an economic recovery. We are in a strong economy. Look at wages. Look at job growth. Those are big positives. But just remember this, and I know it's a little bit tricky. Interest rates have been at zero for a very long time. And when they're at zero, there's nowhere to put your money but the stock market. So that basically means stocks just go up and up and up. But when interest rates get a little bit higher, well, then you can make money in your savings account. Remember, you're going to earn a little bit. So it's a bit of a balancing act to simply say, oh, my gosh, no, we're going to be in bear market territory no matter what. I wouldn't say that. Think about all the good companies out there. And remember, Despite the fact that gas is very high right now, this is just one example, Tom, we're expecting a record summer as it relates to, to summer travel, people going on road trips, people flying. People have saved up a lot of money and they're spending. And while we don't feel good about the economy, we are still out there spending money. And that is a positive when you look at the overall picture. All right, Steph, rule for us. Uh, the crypto world also getting rocked by this market with $200 billion getting completely wiped out. Uh, we want to go now to CNBC technology reporter Kate Rooney. She joins us live. Kate, the crypto world is looking pretty bleak right now. Celsius Network, one of the biggest crypto lending platforms, even paused all withdrawals and transfers this weekend because of what it called, quote, extreme market conditions. What's driving the sell off? Hey, Tom, good to see you. Well, definitely extreme conditions right now. A lot of what's going on and hitting crypto prices right now is the same force you guys have been talking about that's hitting stocks, the Federal Reserve or the Fed raising interest rates. So that makes it more expensive to borrow. And as rates go up, tech companies can't borrow money on the cheap. It eats into future profits and therefore the price of those stocks. But why does it matter at all for crypto? Well, Bitcoin and some of the other cryptocurrencies have really been trading in sync with tech stocks. It's been described and Bitcoin has been described as an exaggerated version of the Nasdaq. So you've got to pay attention to the Fed to see what's happening with Bitcoin. It's been one of the key factors really dragging Bitcoin down. And then on top of that, you've got some really negative industry specific news, mainly Celsius. The fact that one of the biggest crypto lending companies wasn't able to honor customer withdrawals is making people pretty nervous. And it really doesn't bode well for the industry's reputation and what we sometimes call investor sentiment. Yeah, but Kate, I'm, I'm a little confused here because the whole argument with crypto was that it didn't need the Fed, right? It was a whole new thing. It wasn't tied to any country. So why are, and, and I was listening to your analysis, why is it tied so closely to these rate hikes? So it's one effect of Bitcoin really becoming more mainstream and, t and uh, trading 
alongside some of these tech stocks. So if you think about some of the more high profile investors we talk about on CNBC, they've become more open to buying Bitcoin as either a safe haven asset or it's been pretty volatile. So they see it as maybe a short term bet. The more mainstream investors get in, the more they're sort of tied and married in the same portfolio. So if they're going to say, all right, I'm moving away from risk. The Fed is raising interest rates. Bitcoin is often the first place they go to sell. So they're going to take their foot off the gas pedal when it comes to growth and risk. They're looking to Bitcoin. It's liquid, as they call it. They can trade it 24-7. They can trade it on weekends. So it's really been sort of the first line of selling that we've seen, and it tends to get hit even harder than some of the tech stocks. Kate, before you go, you know, in our lifetime, we've seen Bitcoin go from $5 to 60000 now to 23 I think that's what, what our graph showed us there. Does Bitcoin survive this? It's probably too soon to say. I mean, if you've been in this market for a long time, the long term investors would say, yes, that it has gone through multiple cycles. They call this a crypto winter and they're used to it. But there's a lot of newer investors getting in in recent years who are pretty nervous right now. They might have gone out of the market, sold out and said at this point, it's not worth it. And there's a lot of people looking for opportunity here and saying, OK, maybe I can buy Bitcoin at a fraction of the price I was going to pay for it last year. The problem at this point is finding what they call a bottom. The term they use uh, on Wall Street is often catching a falling knife. So the analogy is that somebody drops a knife, it looks like it's settling down, you go to pick it up, and then you get hurt. So there yeah, a are lot a of lot blood of people <laughs> frustrated out there looking for a bottom that we haven't seen, at least for now. All right, Kate Rooney, we thank you so much for that analysis, as always. We want to turn to politics now, and we head to Capitol Hill. We're day two of the January 6th hearings focused on how multiple witnesses who claim former President Trump ignored clear evidence of his election defeat. Some saying he clung on to baseless conspiracies that people close to him said were completely nuts. His former attorney general, Bill Barr, going as far to say President Trump had become detached from reality. Garrett Hake is covering the hearings and has the latest tonight. The January 6th committee's second hearing today hammering home a single message. Donald Trump lost the 2020 election, and he knew it. As a result of his loss, decided to wage an attack on our democracy, and in doing so, lit the fuse that led to the horrific violence of January 6th. The committee relying on the taped testimony of top Trump campaign staff, who urged caution as election night returns showed Joe Biden winning. There were suggestions by, I believe it was Mayor Giuliani, to go and declare victory and say that we'd won it outright. Miller claiming Giuliani was intoxicated. His attorney telling NBC News Giuliani wasn't drinking at all. Trump campaign manager Bill Stepien backing out of a planned live appearance this morning at the last minute after his wife went into labor. Instead, the committee played this videotape of Stepien earlier saying he also disagreed with Giuliani. Ballots were still going to be counted for days, um, and it was far too early to be making any proclamation like that. But the president declared victory on election night anyway. Frankly, we did win this election. Creating a rift in his inner circle that only grew as courts rejected 61 of 62 legal cases filed by the president's team. We called them kind of my team and Rudy's team. I, I didn't mind being characterized as being part of Team Normal. What they were proposing, I thought was nuts. And in the theory, was also completely nuts. The president's embrace of the so-called big lie of a stolen election ultimately leading his attorney general to resign. I thought, boy, if he really believes this stuff, he has, you know, lost contact with, uh, with uh, he's become detached from reality if he really believes this stuff. Republicans largely ignoring the hearings they've called partisan. Even with hundreds of witnesses, thousands of hours of testimony, no ability for uh, for Republicans to do any type of cross-examination, I still don't think there was anything new there. Tonight, Attorney General Garland saying the Justice Department is tracking the testimony. The January 6th prosecutors are watching all the hearings as well. All right, Garrett joins us now from Capitol Hill. And Garrett, we learned of opposing factions within former President Trump's inner circle on election night and beyond. Can you explain, and I know we heard a little bit there in your story, the quote-unquote Team Normal versus Rudy's team, and what were some of the outlandish ideas Rudy's team were pushing? 
Well, for Rudy's team, there was no idea too outlandish to explore, to push, to put in front of a state legislature or a court, whether it be claims that there were 8,000 dead voters in Pennsylvania who voted. That was debunked. Claims of bamboo-infused Chinese ballots in Arizona. I remember that came up a great deal in the audit there in Arizona. Or claims that the Venezuelan dictator Hugo Chavez was somehow involved in switching votes in Dominion voting machines. Chavez has been dead since 2013. All of those ideas debunked, and as each one came forward, the team normal folks, the professional political staffers on Trump's team, pulled themselves further and further back, perhaps trying to preserve their future political careers. All of this exposed by the committee today and in the hearings to come, Tom. Right, Garrett Hake, we thank you for that. Staying in Washington in the bipartisan Senate deal on gun control, lawmakers say they would be the most significant federal gun legislation in decades, focusing on measures like red flag laws and enhanced background checks. NBC News national correspondent Gabe Gutierrez has the details. What's being touted as the most significant deal on new gun legislation in decades could be on the president's desk in weeks, says the GOP's lead negotiator. I think there's a desire to get this thing done sooner rather than later. The framework, agreed to by at least 10 Republicans needed to pass a bill, includes incentives for states to enact so-called red flag laws that allow courts to temporarily take guns away from people deemed dangerous. The plan also includes more money for mental health and school security and sets up a mandatory review of juvenile and mental health records for gun buyers under 21. That step may have stopped the 18-year-old Uvalde shooter from buying his weapons. Today, residents there reacting to the proposed deal. I think the bipartisan deal that they may pass is a small first step. I think they have a long way to go. Other communities rocked by gun violence are also watching closely, from Newtown to Parkland. I don't think this package goes nearly far enough. While the bill's exact language is still being crafted, the agreement would also close the so-called boyfriend loophole, preventing dating partners, not just spouses in domestic violence cases, from having guns. I think that it's a start in the right direction. Do you think the system failed your daughter? Oh, definitely. Pamela Riley's daughter, Rose Marie, was a nursing student in Michigan when her ex-boyfriend shot and killed her and then himself in 2016. To me, the only justice for her is that she wouldn't have died in vain by helping other families. All right, Gabe joins us now. Gabe, it's important to note that this is just the framework for a deal. This is not a done deal yet. Yeah, exactly, Tom. A long way to go here. And in terms of the timeline, what we're hearing, you know, Senator John Cornyn of Texas, that lead negotiator for the Republicans earlier today, he said that could be on President Biden's desk by next week, later on in the day. Then he said in the coming weeks. So there's still a big question on when exactly will happen. One big thing to watch for is the response here from the NRA. The group came out with a statement yesterday saying that it will not comment on a framework that it's waiting for the final bill, but previously it has opposed that so-called boyfriend loophole that I just mentioned in the piece, and the group adds that it will oppose anything that it sees as attacking the Second Amendment. All right, Gabe Gutierrez, good to have you on set, Gabe. All right, next to Idaho, where police tonight are releasing more information about the dozens of members of a white supremacist group who were arrested over the weekend. At least 31 men charged for planning to riot at a Pride in the Park event full of families and children. Their stunning arrests all cut on camera. NBC's Miguel Almaguer has more. They're getting arrested. Tonight, authorities say all 31 members of a white supremacist group on their knees and zip tied before being charged with conspiracy to riot are now out on bail two days after this startling video of their arrest. These guys stopped a U-Haul full of dudes. It happened in Coeur d'Alene, Idaho, after a 911 call from someone who saw the men pile into the back of a U-Haul, dressed like a small army, and headed towards a gay pride event. I have no doubt in my mind that had that van stopped at the park or much near the park, that we still would have ended up in a riot situation. Facing a misdemeanor charge, police say the suspects, members of a group called Patriot Front, had shields and shin guards while also recovering a smoke grenade and a document outlining their operations plan. Authorities say the Pride in the Park event they plan to riot at is where families gathered with children. It was quite a scary sight. It was uh, very intimidating for a lot of us. 
With no response yet from the group's leader, Patriot Front was formed after the Unite the Right rally in Charlottesville, part of a network of hate groups, say experts, who try to spread fear. Did you guys call the cops? Like this group in the Bay Area, said to be members of the Proud Boys who police say could be charged with a hate crime after hurling homophobic insults Saturday during Pride Month at a library. People are lashing out at a greater rate, and we're seeing a, a, a huge spike um, in far-right extremists um, seeking to disrupt peaceful events. Tonight, hate converging with pride in what could have been a violent weekend. Miguel Almaguer joins us now. Miguel, law enforcement has a regular citizen to thank for this takedown. This wasn't exactly an investigation. That community essentially got very lucky. Yeah, that's right, Tom. Police tell us they're always monitoring the Internet for chatter, but they said, quite frankly, this was simply an individual who called 911 after he saw those 31 men kind of pile into the back of a U-Haul. They thought that was suspicious enough to call emergency responders who quickly dispatched to the area. And the police tell us tonight they certainly averted a disaster. Tom. All right, Miguel, we thank you for that. And now new insight to the ongoing baby formula crisis. As federal records reveal many formula plants were never inspected for an entire year during the depths of the pandemic. Our Emily Aketa reports. Just as a major baby formula plant starts up production again tonight, new scrutiny around conditions there before the closure of an Abbott nutrition site in February that accelerated a critical formula shortage. These are the shelves. According to federal records reported by the Associated Press, but not seen by NBC News, the Abbott site went unchecked for two years. Then last fall, inspectors found standing water and inadequate hand washing, but never issued a formal warning. Just months later, the plant was voluntarily closed, according to the FDA, due to bacterial contamination. The AP reports the three biggest baby formula manufacturers weren't inspected at all during 2020. The Food and Drug Administration has said it's committed to anti annual inspections, but that tendency was derailed by the pandemic. FDA was in a, a tough situation. They knew they had to protect the health of their workers in a pandemic crisis, but there, there was a cost to that, and that cost is that they, they missed out on chances to catch food safety issues. The FDA told the AP it skipped about 15,000 U.S. inspections because of COVID, though it has already made up a third of those. The agency telling NBC News last week, our top priority right now is addressing the dire need for infant formula in the U.S market going on to say including ensuring Abbott takes the appropriate corrective action to address insanitary conditions observed by the FDA at the end of May out of stock rates of baby formula soared to 74 percent nationally according to data assembly with one in five states almost completely out of formula it's just been such a struggle to find any formula anywhere as if moms need more things to do exactly like we're busy enough trying to get through the day with the kids, and now it's another thing that we have to worry about. Many families hope outside help will ease the desperate scramble for the critical food source. 95,000 tins of baby formula were flown in from Australia Sunday, with millions of more bottles on the way this month. But some, like Maricela Latch, aren't holding their breath. Have you noticed any kind of improvement on store shelves in recent days or weeks? I have, but not with the one I need. It's ridiculous to think that, that like a newborn can't be fat. All right, we thank Emily Aketa for that. Still ahead tonight, the deadly camp shootout. An armed man and police exchanging gunfire at a facility in Texas where 150 children were attending summer camp. No children injured. The update tonight from police. Plus, former WWE star Jeff Hardy arrested in Florida. The felony charges he's now facing. And breaking her silence, the exclusive interview with Amber Heard after a jury found she defamed ex-husband Johnny Depp. What she said about the verdict and the social media frenzy surrounding the trial. Stay with us. All right, we're back tonight hearing from Amber Heard for the first time in an exclusive NBC News interview with Savannah Guthrie. After a jury found she defamed her ex-husband Johnny Depp, Heard is now explaining how she believes social media affected the trial's outcome. NBC's Stephen Romo has more. 
Tonight, Amber Heard opening up for the first time since the blockbuster trial where a jury unanimously found she defamed her ex-husband, Johnny Depp. Sitting down with the Today Show and Dateline's Savannah Guthrie. I don't care what one thinks about me um, or what judgments you want to make about what happened in the privacy of my own home and my marriage behind closed doors. I, I don't presume the average person should know those things, and so I don't take it personally, but even somebody who is sure I'm deserving of all this hate and vitriol. Even if you think that I'm lying, you still couldn't look me in the eye and tell me that you think on social media there's been a fair representation. You cannot tell me that you think that this has been fair. Heard's claims are in line with her attorney's allegations that social media played a role in this trial. There's no way they couldn't have been influenced by it. And it was horrible. Depp's team has refuted allegations that they orchestrated an attack on Heard through social media. Do you know anything about an online campaign uh, on behalf of Johnny Depp? That is utterly baseless. The defamation case centered around Heard's 2018 op-ed published in the Washington Post in which she describes herself as a public figure representing domestic abuse. The article never names Depp, but his lawyers argue it clearly references him and cost him millions of dollars in lost wages. The jury awarded him more than $10 million. There's no polite way to say it. The jury looked at the evidence you presented. They listened to your testimony and they did not believe you. They thought you were lying. How could, I'll put it this way, how could they make a judgment? How could they not come to that conclusion? They had sat in those seats and heard th over three weeks of nonstop, relentless testimony from paid employees and towards the end of the trial, randos, <laughs> as I say. So you but don't blame the jury? I don't blame them. It wasn't, I, I don't blame them. I actually understand he's a beloved character and people feel they know him. He's a fantastic actor. Their job is to not be dazzled by that. Their job is to look at the facts and the evidence and they did not believe your testimony or your evidence. I, again, how, how could they, after listening to three and a half weeks of testimony, about how I was a non credible person, not to believe a word that came out of my mouth. All right, Stephen Romo joins us now here live in studio. So, Stephen, we know that Savannah's going to have much more of this interview, but the big thing we don't know, will she appeal this? We know she wants to, but she also says she doesn't have the money to pay Johnny Depp, the, the $10 million she now owes him. Yeah, something many people are eager to hear about. We have heard from her attorneys in the past saying that she does want to appeal this case and, again, that she cannot pay that $10 million, but exactly what she plans to do in this case and what she plans to do in her career. A lot of questions left. Hopefully, we'll get some answers this week. Yeah, and there's, there's also the, the, the Depp side, which there's this thinking that maybe she doesn't appeal and then Johnny Depp won't make her pay her the defamation because he said this wasn't about money, it was about his reputation. Stephen, we thank you for all of that. And you can watch more of this exclusive interview tomorrow and Wednesday on NBC's Today Show, uh, Friday, June 17th on Dateline at 8 p.m. Eastern, of course, only on NBC. All right, when we come back, the plane on the green, the small airplane making an emergency landing on a golf course, what we're learning about the two people on board. Stay with us. All right, we're back down with Top Stories News Feed, and we begin with the police shooting at a summer camp outside of Dallas, Texas. Police say an armed man entered the facility in Duncanville where more than 150 children were attending camp and shot at a glass door. Officers arrived within two minutes, exchanging gunfire with the suspect inside the gymnasium. Luckily, no children were injured. The suspect was shot and killed. Former WWE star Jeff Hardy has been arrested on felony DUI charges in Florida. The wrestler was arrested in Volusia County early this morning. He's also facing charges for driving with a suspended or revoked license. It's the third time since 2018 he's been accused of driving under the influence. He was set to wrestle with his brother Matt Hardy for an AEW match this week. No word yet on if that will take place. And a small plane was forced to make an emergency landing at a Colorado golf course. Aerial footage shows the twin engine plane on the course outside of Denver. The two pilots on board walking away unharmed and no injuries reported on the ground. 
No word yet on why this happened. The FAA and the NTSB are both investigating. And character actor Philip Baker Hall died at the age of 90. The prolific actor's career spanned five decades across film, television, and theater. Hall was a regular in the early films of Paul Thomas Anderson like Boogie Nights and Magnolia and became a familiar face for his numerous guest appearances on Cheers, Seinfeld and Modern Family. All right, in Ukraine tonight, Russian forces are gaining more ground on the Eastern Front. More than 11 million people have now fled Ukraine, but many children with disabilities have been left behind. Richard Engel takes us inside an orphanage where the most vulnerable face heartbreaking conditions. The Vilshani Orphanage is home to more than 200 physically and intellectually challenged Ukrainians. They're not really orphans. Nearly everyone here was abandoned. Some of the older ones have been here for decades without a single visit. And now Russia's invasion has made their lives even more difficult. The facility is overcrowded after similar shelters in eastern Ukraine were evacuated out of the path of Russian troops. Two vital therapy rooms had to be converted into dormitories for 38 new arrivals. Hello. Masha just came from the east. She's alert and bone thin, with a trail from tears down her temple. So this is Roxalana. Hello. I'm going to pull this down a little bit, and you can see really terrible scoliosis, really terrible condition of the the body and spine. You okay? You okay? Not so skinny. They're all so skinny. Without stretching, braces, surgery, or therapy, Roxolana and the others are getting worse. Some appear malnourished. This is not a hospital. They don't do advanced treatments or give much medication. Hi. You've got such a lovely smile. The most we could give was attention, touch, and affection. Catherine lit up when I rubbed her hand. No, you don't want to let me go. I don't want to let you go either. Many are clearly starving for love and their families. Mama. For the last several hours, Vlad here has been calling out to his mother. And it's one of the hardest things you can see because a lot of the kids here have been calling out to mom, mom and dad. Mama. And they're not coming. Vlad's parents fled to Germany as refugees, along with his three healthy siblings. This war has a dark secret. Many able-bodied children were taken out of Ukraine, while the profoundly disabled were often left behind in shelters like this. A bad system that neglected kids, that left children to grow up without a family, is now massively overwhelmed. Eric Rosenthal has studied shelters for the disabled in Ukraine for 30 years. Every single day a child spends in this facility, they're losing a piece of their life. The director, Bogdan Kakina, says he had to suspend modernization plans because of Russia's invasion. This damn war set back their development, he says. Victims of a cruel biological fate and an outdated medical system, they are now also victims of a war that has left them more isolated than ever. Mama! Richard Engel for us from Ukraine. All right, time now for Top Stories Global Watch and firefighters in China rushing to rescue dozens trapped by flash flooding. First responders using inflatable boats in the Guangxi Zhuang Autonomous Region of southern China. Authorities rescuing more than 40 construction workers trapped in a temporary housing building. It's the latest in a string of heavy rains to hit the region this flood season. And severe weather also prompting rescues in the Australian state of Tasmania. Blizzard conditions hitting the Tasmanian mountains. At least eight hikers rescued. A 27-year-old woman and a 16-year-old girl hospitalized for hypothermia. They're in serious condition. Thousands are without power. The cold front right now traveling to Australia's mainland, causing massive swells along the coast. And Disney and Pixar's Lightyear is now being banned in multiple countries amid reports of a same-sex kiss. The United Arab Emirates announcing the top story spinoff would... Uh, I should say Toy Story spinoff, would not open in theaters there due to violation of the country's media content standards. Officials did not offer more details, but the film does include a kiss between two female characters. Local media outlets in Malaysia and Bahrain also reporting bans on that movie. 
All right, we want to turn now to the Americas, where the search for a British journalist and his expert guide in Brazil is only leading to more questions. Tonight, conflicting reports that bodies were found, only adding to the family's frustration as they struggle to keep hope that their loved ones will be found alive. Here's NBC's George Solis. Tonight, confusion turning into frustration as the search intensifies for British journalist Dom Phillips and his guide, Bruno Pereira, deep in the Amazon. The Guardian, a UK paper Phillips had worked for, reports a Brazilian diplomat notified the family this morning the pair's bodies were found, only later to have Brazilian federal police say only their belongings were discovered in a remote part of the Amazon jungle more than a week after the duo vanished. The conflicting reports come as the very community Phillips spent years reporting on is calling for answers in justice in the disappearance of the veteran reporter and his expert guide. In the town of Atalaya del Norte, one of the last areas the men were spotted, hundreds of protesters gathering, some holding signs asking who killed Bruno and Dom. We are uh, praying and, and we are crossing our fingers and hoping. Phillips' sister spoke to Top Story days after her brother disappeared. The family has criticized the Brazilian government's search response. We keep the pressure on. We have to. We have to find um, answers and we have to hold those responsible to justice. You know, we have to have justice for these mm. two, two men. Just this weekend, the Brazilian army once again took to the air to search this vast area of the Amazon jungle. Also taking to the river, conducting a more focused search near where they were last seen. Investigators have sent organic matter found in the river for analysis and are investigating a fisherman after local detectives found possible human blood in his boat. Phillips spent years covering the remote area, hoping to raise awareness of the illegal activity, including illegal fishing, logging and drug trafficking that threatens the indigenous people who call Brazil's Javari Valley region home. A gente, a gente já não acreditava já na, de encontrar o nosso colega com vida, né? Então, a union representing them says the pair had been threatened days before they vanished. Eles dormiram aqui de sexta para sábado, do sábado para domingo. É. Você ouviu eles indo embora? Não, eu não tive tempo de falar, mas porque aqui é meio quatro. Some concrete evidence did come over the weekend when authorities found items belonging to both men. Bald in this blue tarp are what Brazilian federal authorities say are a backpack, laptop, and other personal items. As the local people march for both answers and justice, Phillips' family is keeping the pair's work in the spotlight. What do you want the world to know about Bruno and your brother? He was very brave, I mean. He went into a place he must have known that he was taking uh, risks with his own safety to expose, you know, the dangers that these indigenous people are, are living under at the moment. And Tom, we reached out to the family who is trying to separate fact from fiction. They are angry and heartbroken, and they decline to comment until they have more clarity in an investigation that continues to grow more complicated. Tom. All right, George Solis, we thank you for that. Coming up, sky-high rent, average monthly rent prices hitting record levels. Some seen prices more than double in the last two years. So what's driving the surge, and is there any end in sight? All right, we're back now with a look at the red-hot rental market. Prices across the country skyrocketing, pushing the median monthly asking price over $2,000 for the first time ever. That happened in May. One of the area's hardest hit is South Florida. NBC Sam Brock is there as part of the NBC cross-platform series Priced Out with a look at what's driving those hikes. The only thing hotter than the South Florida summer sun might be its real estate market, which can jolt families like Laron Padlins. Did you have any sense that this was coming? Uh, no, I saw what was happening, but I didn't think it was gonna hit me. Padlin had been renting this Aventura home for two years when that jaw-dropping email came. The $4,000 rent would rise to $6,500, a 63% increase. Her landlord told us that his rent went up, so he had to raise theirs. At any point did the thought go through your head, this might make our family homeless? Absolutely. I saw us on the streets because uh, there was nowhere to go. Laurent locked out. I'm going to move in this one. A friend had a home to rent her under market value. Rare good fortune in Florida, where the population grew by more than 360,000 in one year of the pandemic, with many flocking to warmer weather and looser COVID rules. A recent Realtor.com report found the Miami Metro tops the country for rent increases. A staggering 58% between March of 2020 and 2022, with Florida notching two other cities in the top five. Success 
has led to this crisis. And we're attacking it aggressively by helping people in the short term uh, with rental assistance. Miami-Dade's mayor signed a tenant's bill of rights offering more legal protections, but she says rent caps can only be implemented at the state level, with no sign of that on the table. And in this scalding hot market, it's not just the high-end properties. More with basic homes for blue-collar workers that are working, you know, your regular job. Hector Alvarez was one of the few landlords willing to talk with us. His family owns 10 properties in this neighborhood where he says, yes, he's raised rent, but by the hundreds, not the thousands like other landlords. The people coming in can afford to pay more because they have higher income, especially if they come from California or they come from New York. So you think part of it is opportunism? Opportunism, part of it, and part of it is just blatant unfairness and, and being you know, crazy. like Greed. Greed, that's the word, they're greed. Whatever you call it. It's just sad, it's very sad. It's a market sending some renters Packing. Sam Brock, NBC News, Miami. All right, we thank Sam for that report. When we come back, he's part of America's greatest generation, and he just got a great birthday surprise. The U.S. vet, 100 years young, why he suddenly got a lot to read. Stay with us. Finally tonight, Cards for Harold, the grandson of an Ohio World War II vet, asking the community for 100 birthday cards to help celebrate his 100th birthday. The response from around the country, overwhelming. This month, World War II vet and Ohio native Harold Myers has a big milestone to celebrate. My name, Harold. Today I'm 99. In three weeks, I'll be 100. That was Harold in early May, speaking with our Cleveland station, WKYC. His grandson had a plan to help make the Big 100 extra special. Do I know what he's doing? Yeah. Partially. Trying to get 100 cards for his 100th birthday. They left the word out, a card sending. The goal is definitely 100. Would I take 1,000, 500? Absolutely so. I mean, the, the goal is definitely 100, though, if we could make that happen. Harold telling his story of service, serving with the U.S. Army as a quartermaster, helping supply those on the front lines and reaching the rank of staff sergeant. That story and the call for cards resonating around the country, even around the world, all leading up to this moment last week. Happy birthday. Happy birthday. So to get 10,000 cards has just been huge. To see everybody, we got all 50 states. Um, Finland, France, Canada, but it's just really cool to see everybody get behind this. Thank you for your many sacrifices. It is by your actions that today we feel safe and free. 10,000 birthday cards. The perfect birthday surprise for the vet who loves to read. Well, he's a great reader. He always goes to the library, but now that's over with because... <laughs> Harold says he might need some help reading every single card. I'll take all the help I can get. I put a sign up out here in the yard. For grandson Dan, a mission accomplished. His grandfather overwhelmed with fan mail. Like Tom Hanks and stuff being America's dad, so we have America's grandpa. I love it. Well, uh, I can't imagine that many people having any idea who Harold Myers was <laughs> or is. And a big happy birthday to Harold. We thank him for his service and for sharing that incredible moment with us. And we thank you for watching Top Story tonight. I'm Tom Yamas in New York. Stay right there. More news on the way. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.